All right. Thank you, Michael. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I am really enjoying uh, this series on Revelation. I want to thank the person that uh, asked me to do this series, even though I was reluctant and put it off for a long time because I was afraid of it. Uh, I'm really getting a lot out of it. I'm enjoying it. I've read Revelation many times, uh, but it's just different this time around as we focus in on these seven churches. And today we come to Smyrna, the second uh, in our group of seven. And there's a pattern that emerges. If you look at all the message to each church, there's a pattern that's the same. And it, it always begins with Jesus revealing some aspect of himself to the church. He describes himself differently each time, but it's always something to do with what that church is going to need. Uh, you remember that uh, at Ephesus he described... Uh, himself as the one who holds the seven stars in one hand and walks among the candlesticks. And now we all know what that's all about. And uh, this morning uh, to Smyrna, he's going to describe himself as the one who died and overcame death. And uh, on it goes. Uh, to Pergamum next time, he will describe himself as a sharp two-edged sword. And to Thyatira as the son of God. To Sardis as the one who has the seven spirits and the seven stars. And to Philadelphia, he will describe himself as the holy and true one. And to Laodicea, the faithful and true witness, the beginning and the end. So I, I hope you're beginning to see how we can use this uh, genre of literature and somebody can describe something in several different ways and be talking about the very same thing. All of these are different descriptions, but they're all talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, if you read through those seven churches, you'll find that each letter begins with an affirmation. He says something good about them. And those of you that have taken management classes and that know that, you know, when you're, when you're going to uh, help someone uh, in some aspect of their, their job, you begin with a little affirmation. And you hopefully can end with some affirmation also. And that's what Jesus does. He begins affirming what's good about the church. And then he addresses the problem that they're facing. And then he ends by telling them that they are going to overcome. And if they do, there's a great reward for them. So you see, all the sound management practices that you've learned over the years are written in this book. And that's where they all come from. So that's good. We want to see what Jesus has to say to this church at Smyrna. Because Smyrna is different in a lot of ways. But one of the big ways it's different in is that there is no but in Smyrna. The letter to Smyrna. You know, in the, other, in the others, Jesus says, you're good at this, that, and the other thing. But I have this against you, right? Mm -hmm. There's no but in Smyrna. He has nothing against the church at Smyrna. And there's one other in our list of seven with no but in it either. And I'll leave it to you to figure out which one that is. Maybe you'll be curious enough to actually read through them this afternoon. So there's two churches in this list that Jesus has nothing against. And that's very interesting to me because Smyrna is known as the persecuted church. Smyrna is really struggling. And yet, according to Jesus, they've done nothing wrong. He has nothing against them. Well, let's look in here and see what we can find. Remember now, one of our, our uh, basis points that we're starting with is that this whole book was written to those churches, real churches, at that time, it was applicable to them, and it remains applicable to us. So we, we can take these things and, and bring them right here home with us. So let's look at a little background at Smyrna. You remember that Ephesus uh, was quite the city. And, and Smyrna is also a very prosperous city. They're not quite as uh, prosperous as Ephesus was, but they're very prosperous. And one of the reasons they're prosperous is they have a major export, and that major export is myrrh. And that's actually in the name Smyrna. Okay? And what is myrrh known for biblically? 
You, you may or may not know, but it, it has to do with death. Right? Remember, this, there's two other places in the New Testament that this word myrrh shows up. And one, of course, you all know, and you've known it since you were a little bitty kid. And Christians and non-Christians alike know it. Because what did the three wise men bring? Sure, they brought myrrh. That was one of the three gifts. Okay? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And in that story, myrrh is said to represent the fact that Jesus is going to suffer and die. It shows up again uh, in John chapter 19, uh, verse 39, when Jesus has been crucified and Nicodemus shows up and he brings myrrh to anoint the body and get it ready for burial. So myrrh was their big export and uh, that uh, generated a lot of money for them and sort of it got the city a name that somehow unfortunately it was living up to. The, the name Smyrna is linked with mourning. Indeed, as we will see, the church at Smyrna was more than used to suffering. They suffered from uh, without the Roman Empire. They suffered from, uh, within and the fact that uh, uh, the Jews were, were after them all the time. They were suffering because of their witness for Christ. The Romans didn't like it because they put Christ before Caesar. The Jews didn't like it because they preached Christ instead of Judaism. Now, you would think, we would think, I, I believe most of us, that if we are doing what God wants us to do, God's going to bless us. Right? Don't you think so? Smyrna is doing exactly what God wants them to do. They're holding forth a witness for Christ in a hostile environment and they're getting beat up for it. They're getting persecuted for it. How can that be? You look here at uh, the first two verses that Michael read for us. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but a synagogue of Satan. Wow. So, Jesus says... I know your suffering, I know your tribulation. He doesn't say, I'm going to remove it. He doesn't say, I'm going to make everything okay. And don't we do that, don't we make that mistake sometimes when we're, we're witnessing to people? Isn't it tempting to say, well, you know, if you just accept Christ, uh, he'll heal your marriage. Or if you'll just accept Christ, he'll heal your cancer. Or if you just accept Christ, you'll get a great new job next week. But see, the error we fall into when we do that is we're speaking for God when we have no business speaking for God. And then what often, all too often, tragically happens is they make some kind of a profession based on what we've told them. Then what we've told them doesn't come true. Because in our finite minds, it's so very difficult for us to separate the fact that sometimes we can be right in the center of God's will doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing and life on this earth will still be hell. And what did Jesus say himself? John 16, 33, In this world you will have philipsis, the word tribulation, the same word we see here all the time. Tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So, there, there's going to be an end to it, but for now we may have to suffer tribulation. He, see, he presents himself to Smyrna as the one who overcame death and the grave. Why? Because the persecution or suffering is so severe, it's going to end in death for many of them. So he says to them, I am the one who has overcome death and the grave. Now you say, well, what kind of persecution were they suffering? Well, uh, it, again, we talked about the two possible dates for Revelation. You remember there's an early date and a late date. The early date would make Nero the emperor. The late date would make Domitian the emperor. Now, oftentimes we are under the mistaken idea that all of Rome always persecuted the Christians. That's not correct. 
Uh, Rome was a brutal place, whether you were a Christian or a non-Christian. But there were only two empire-wide persecutions of the Christians. One by Nero and one by Domitian. So one of these two guys is on the throne. I know which one it was, but I won't tell you. You have to figure it out for yourself. Either way, these guys were brutal. You've heard a lot about Nero, probably more about him than you have about Domitian, but they were just brutal, and, and they were just bad people. So either way, they're suffering this terrible persecution. And what God is saying is, he's saying what Jesus is saying is, for Christians, death is not something to be feared. Remember what he keeps saying over and over? Fear not. Well, he says the same thing to us today. We're all going to face death unless he returns before we get there. But we're all going to die. But we don't have to be afraid of that. It's okay. It's just part of the process. It's just part of becoming better. Uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, uh, verse 1, it says this, The day you die is better than the day of your birth. And I think we, we, kind of, we say, what? The day you die is better than the day of your birth. So what do we do? I think we've got it backwards. What do we celebrate? Until we get so old and then we kind of wish we didn't celebrate it so much anymore. Yeah. We celebrate birthdays and they're fun and it's a big deal. But what do we do when somebody dies? We mourn. Okay. But if they're a Christian and they've died, where are they? With Christ. Where's, where's the better place to be? With Christ. See? But it's hard for us to get that. Now, in saying that, we need to remember that it's God's business how long we live and when we die. We're not to help him out, you know, either with ourselves or with somebody else, though you may think there are a few out there that deserve it. <laughs> I've got a friend it's a lifelong policeman and he likes to say the only reason some people are still alive is because it's against the law to shoot them. <laughs> and you may think that about some folks, but that's as far as you get to go with it. Okay? Leave that part up to God. Now I want to say something else. Now that's, I'm kind of talking about suicide and murder there. But I want to talk about something else for just a brief second. And that's the difference between a martyr and a murderer. Okay. Now here's the difference between a martyr and a murderer. A martyr, because we, we really misuse this term all the time, especially in the press. A martyr is someone who is killed for their faith. Okay, you got that? A murderer is someone who kills someone else for their faith. Got it? Okay. So a suicide bomber is not a martyr in any sense of the word. A suicide bomber is a murderer, plain and simple. Okay. Martyrs get killed, murderers kill other people. That's the difference. Okay. So, the day of your death for a Christian is really better than the day of your birth. Because if you think you've had some awesome birthday parties here, wait till you get there. I, I can't even imagine what that's going to be like. But it's going to be better than all the parties we've ever had here. But again, the caveat you always have to throw in when you're talking about these things, it's God's business. It's God's timing. Leave that up to Him. But we will face death. Indeed, we will all die. God's word to us is clear and familiar, and that is simply, fear not. I died. I came back to life. I know what it's like. I know that you're going through tribulation. I know that you're having problems. To go back to the, the, the language in Ephesus, I'm right here walking among you. It's all right. But what do we do when we're going through tribulation? We tend to cry out, and instead of saying, God, I know you're with me, we say, where's God? Why has he abandoned me? And that's because we're so programmed, and I am too, I have to consciously fight against this all the time. We're so programmed to thinking good times represent God's favor, bad times represent God's displeasure on our life. And it's just not true. 
Now it may be from time to time, but as a blanket statement, it's just not true. God knows our tribulation. That's what he says to these folks. He knows our problems. He knows our financial problems. He knows our physical problems. He knows our relationship problems. He knows all that. In fact, look at this, what he says. His thinking is so different than our thinking. He says to these folks at Smyrna, he says, I know your poverty. But then what does he say? But you are rich. Now they were a poverty-stricken church. They were an unpopular group. They were a small group. Nobody liked them. Romans didn't like them. Jews didn't like them. Nobody. And yet, Jesus says to them, you guys are rich. What in the world can he be talking about? I think, and I'd like you to entertain this thought, I think that God may judge by a different standard than we do. He may see things differently than we see them. Now, I know you guys more or less as a demographic group. And, you know, I can say we're all kind of in the same boat financially. And sometimes we have more than we have less. But if God was here, he would say, you guys are all rich. But he wouldn't be talking about our wallets, I don't think. You see. And he wasn't at Smyrna. But look at this. Let's go clear back. This is a piece of scripture you all know, but I want to share it with you anyway. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. Now, the deal is, uh, Samuel's told to pick a king, right? And he goes and he's going to look at all these sons. And here these sons come and they're great looking guys, you know. And he brings, the first one shows up, Eliab, and he says this. Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Okay, this is Samuel speaking. He says, look at this guy. This has got to be the man. He's tall, he's handsome, he's rugged, he's all this stuff, he's smart. But, the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees, this is what I want you to get, not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And if you remember last week's message, what was wrong with the church at Ephesus? A heart problem. Remember, they looked good, they were prosperous, they were doctrinally correct, and all those things are good. I strive to be doctrinally correct. But you've got to have your heart right, or it's all for naught. Now, here we have the reverse. We have a church where their heart is right, but everything around them seems to be going wrong. I don't get it. Do you? No, I don't. I can come up with a hundred explanations, but I don't know that any of them are correct. All I know is we can be struggling. We can be, think we're dying. And we can be right where God wants us to be. God sees things differently than we do. God measures with a different yardstick than we measure with. Uh, the majority of evangelicals today would look at a church like Ephesus and say, Look at that church. God's got to love that church. And they'd look at a church like Smyrna and say, well, there must be something wrong there. They're not growing, they're struggling, they don't, they don't have this, they don't have that. Surely God is not pleased with that church. But then God looks down and he says, Smyrna, you guys are rich. You're spiritually rich. You're great. And he looks over here at Ephesus and he says, you guys are out to lunch. Your hearts aren't right. So everything you do is not pleasing to me. God sees things differently than we see things. Let's take a look at the adversary. We have a little description of what's going on here in uh, verses 9 and 10. 
Jesus says, and the, and the slanderer of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Those who say they are Jews and are not are of the synagogue of Satan. You say that's pretty strong language? Yeah. What's one of the things we really don't like in the evangelical world today from a leader? It's really strong language. If you want to get in trouble in a hurry, just stand up. If, you know, if you're well known enough to, for people to pay attention to you, I can say anything I want, nobody cares. You know. <laughs> but if you're a big name, stand up and actually come against something hard and see what happens to you. You'll be accused of not being loving. You'll be accused of all sorts of things. But here we have... Jesus revealing himself and he's saying these guys are a synagogue of Satan. Wow. They say that what, he, what he's saying is when they say they are Jews and are not he's not saying that, that they're saying they're Jewish nationality but they're, they're really some other nationality. What he's saying is they're saying they're my people and they're not. They're saying they are my people and they are still going through the motions in the, in the temple and all that and sacrificing and all that. But I wiped all that out when I died. Right? So what they have done is they've rejected me. Which makes them then Satan's people. If you've been around a while, you know that, that I contend there are only two groups of people on earth at any given time. God's people and not God's people. And what does Jesus say about those that aren't God's people? What did he say to the Pharisees when they, they claim to be God's people? He says, you are of your father, the devil. Ooh, pretty strong language, isn't it? So there's a time to use strong language. Now, I don't expect you to go out and go up to your, your non-Christian friend and say, Aha! You son of Satan, you! Now, please don't do that. <laughs> but there is a time to take a stand. There is a time to uh, use some strong language. Uh, and, and that's what's going on here. Uh, to quote Dennis Johnson, he says, uh, he says this. He says, Though ethnically descended from Israel's patriarchs, their actions show that they are not God's people, but Satan's people. Right? See, their actions brand them. By rejecting Christ, they embrace Satan. Now, again, don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean they're all satanic and all that sort of thing. But that's what you, you are either one or the other when it comes to salvation. You are either going to one place or the other. You are either serving one God or the other. Not that he's a God. But you're either serving one master or another master. And what does Jesus say about that? How many masters can you serve at a time? One. You can't serve them both. You can't say I'm a little bit Christian and a little bit non-Christian. You're either one or the other. Now, again, a little caveat, we aren't to judge those things. That's for Christ. We can judge behavior, we, we can judge that, but we can't judge a person's salvation. That's up to God. So, look with me, if you will, at Romans chapter 9, verses 6, 8, and 27. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. So here it is now. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise as counted as offspring. And then verse 27, And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, 
only a remnant of them will be saved. And then Paul carries on the argument in Galatians, chapter 3, verse 7, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And in verses 28 and 29, you all should know these verses here. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Do you see anywhere in Paul's literature that he describes a third estate? I don't. I don't. I know there's some theologians that claim, oh yeah, we've got the church, we've got Israel, and we've got Jews. No. We've got God's people and not God's people. That's what we've got. So I ran onto a great, a great article dealing with this. Maybe one reason I think it's great because I think the guy that wrote it is great. But anyway, his name's Art Arzurdia, and he's a uh, <clears throat> professor over here at Western Seminary. And he came up with what, for me, was a new way of saying this. And I really like it. Now, here's, he's talking about this line in here, that they're a synagogue of Satan. And he says, My friends, that is a profoundly important statement. When we watch the flow of redemptive history, the storyline of the Bible unfold, and we move from the epic of promise to the epic of fulfillment, God's people are no longer defined genealogically. They are defined Christologically. Christocentrically. You see? And he goes on and he says, Now friends, people often ask me, do you believe the church replaces Israel? That's where you get in trouble when you tell people the church has now replaced Israel. The answer is no, of course not. The church does not replace Israel. The latter is the consummated expression of the former. You see, it's just a natural progression. Israel was the epic of promise, or the age of promise, the covenant of promise, whatever uh, language you want to use there. But now that the Messiah has come, now that Jesus has come, the age of promise is done because the promise has been fulfilled. Having offered one sacrifice for one time, he sat down. It's done. So now the whole system of Judaism becomes anathema to Christ. Because every time they perform a sacrifice, what are they saying? They're saying Christ's sacrifice isn't enough. And that's what they were still doing in the synagogues and that in the temple. So he says, don't worry about these guys. These persecutors are not God's people, but Satan's people. If this weren't enough, there's Roman persecution. We talked about that. Jesus tells us who the real enemy is here. And who is it? Well, what does he say? Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Now, remember we've talked about phenomenological language? So what does he mean? Does that mean that Satan's going to show up with his horns and his tail and his pitchfork and toss him into... No, of course not. But it means he is the motivator behind these folks' actions. And it just dawned on me. Did I say Domitian a while ago? I meant to say Diocletian anyway. Anyway, never mind. That's alright. Okay. Sometimes my mouth goes faster than my brain. So, there's, there's something in there for us to take away too. When we are struggling with somebody, when somebody's coming against us, when somebody's attacking us uh, for no good reason, we are to look beyond that person and recognize the source. Okay? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, what does it say? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities and so on and so forth. You see? And that's exactly what he's saying to this church here. He says, Satan's going to toss you guys into prison. Satan's going to persecute you guys. Well, he's not going to show up in person. He's going to motivate these other folks to do that to them. And he hasn't changed his mode of operation yet. 
So when somebody is coming against you, when they're causing you problems, always try to stop. I know it's hard, but try to stop and ask yourself, what's, what's behind this person? What's motivating this person? And that will help you to be able to deal with that person in love. I know it's hard. Instead of just coming against them, you can begin to recognize the spiritual battle that's going on all around, and you can take the matter to prayer. And it will be of great help to you. So, if we can do everything right, as much as possible spiritually, and still suffer, what's our hope? Well, our hope is in Christ. And we see it here in verses 10 and 11. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Let me back up just a minute. That ten days, by the way, what does that mean? That's simply a number that tells us that this persecution, this time of tribulation, is not going to go on forever. It will have an end. So whatever you're going through now, and you know, not all of us are going through all these things, but we've all gone through things where we've thought to ourselves, is this ever going to end? Am I ever going to be free of this thing? And the answer is yes. It will. Jesus and the Bible always tell it like it is. And that's why he says you're going to suffer persecution. To say anything else would be an untruth. But our tribulation will not go on forever. Now one, one piece of scripture I love is Isaiah 43, verse 2 and 3. And here's what it says. It says, when you go through deep waters and great trouble. Now, now notice, it doesn't say if you go through deep waters and great trouble. It says when you go through deep waters and great trouble, I, that's Jesus, will be with you. When you walk through the fire of oppression, well, excuse me, I, I, I skipped a line. I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. Yeah? That's our promise of eternal life. See, we, we'll go through deep waters. We'll struggle with the current. We'll maybe go down a couple of times and think we're going to drown. But we won't. We'll go through the fire. We'll be refined by the fire. But we won't be burned up. Why? Because we have Christ. I'm... Uh, not much on swimming. I didn't learn to swim till I was almost an adult. Never learned to swim very well. But uh, I, I like white water rafting. So we're over here at Maupin one time doing this raft trip. And I, probably some of you have been on that same raft trip. And you go down there and you come to a place where the river's real narrow and it's got these big rapids. And the thing to do is they beach the boat and you hike up there, I don't know, 100 yards, whatever it is, and you jump in. And you... So you got this big life jacket on, this Mae West looking thing. So I think, well, okay, I'll do it, mainly because everybody else was doing it and I didn't want to be the wimpy guy. So I go up there and I think about it. And I, well, okay. So I jumped. And you know, about halfway between the bank and the, hitting the water, I thought, uh oh. <laughs> Too late to change my mind. So I hit the water, and what you do is you just face downstream, you know, and down you go like a cork with that Mae West thing on. But what I thought to do, I get down there and I try to lift myself up out of the water. Well, as soon as I lift my upper body out of the water, I sink. And then he'd catch me, and then I'd lift up and I'd sink again. Well, I finally, dumb as, dumb as I am even, I figured out that if I just lay back and relax, I wouldn't sink. And that, you know, that's the way Jesus is. You know, we may be going like this, but we've got him. We've got that May West on, and if we'll just relax, we'll be okay. And so it was okay. Then I did it two or three more times, and it was kind of cool. But it was not cool until I learned to trust the fact that that life jacket was going to hold me up. In this world, you will have tribulation. 
As Christians, we need to understand that sometimes our deliverance comes through what? Death, doesn't it? You know, it's interesting to me. We pray for so-and-so to be healed of cancer. And they die. And our first thought is, God didn't answer my prayer. But for a Christian, what is the ultimate healing? Isn't, isn't that the ultimate healing? To be free from this body and to be with the Lord? I'll bet you if you took a poll in heaven, you cannot find one person that would say to you, well, gee, I really wish I was back on the earth. It was so much better than this. No, you won't. They're all going to say, man, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> There's a story I heard. Yeah, it's it's kind of cute. The, these two old folks were driving down a road, probably my age, but anyway, old folks, and uh, ran off the road and hit a tree, and they're both killed instantly. They've been married for 40 years, and they're Christians, so they, poof, they're in heaven. And they're walking around, and they're looking at the place, and it's absolutely beautiful. Just stunning. And uh, the wife is so happy, and Olga was her name, and uh, his name is Olaf, and that's just the names. I don't know, don't send me any letters about ethnicity. So anyway, Olga can't help but notice that Olaf is becoming agitated. She married to him for 40 years. She can read his mind, pretty much, and she, the f more they look checking out heaven, the, the more agitated he's getting, and the veins are kind of popping out. And finally, she says, my goodness, Olaf, what's wrong with you? Don't you like it here? He says, I love it here. And if you wouldn't have made me eat all those stinking bran muffins, I could have been here 10 years sooner. <laughs> so there you go. Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So again, when it comes to death, Jesus is saying, fear not. It's okay. I died, and I rose, and now I reign in heaven forever and ever and ever. And now look what awaits those who die for Christ's sake. The crown of life in verse 10. Wouldn't that be awesome? Now, everybody doesn't get the crown of life. There's different crowns mentioned in the scripture. And we don't all automatically get them. They are for service above and beyond. It's like when you're in the military. Uh, there are certain medals that you get for doing certain things. And this crown of, of life is for those who have died died for Christ. It's for the martyrs, the big name ones that you've heard, and all of those little folks like you and I that were killed for their faith. And somehow, I don't know just how it's going to work, but wouldn't that be cool when you get up there to heaven and, and, and they say, look at these people over here. They've got the crown of life. They remain faithful until death. Now, I think what he's talking about when he says faithful until death, he's not talking about us living out our lives being faithful to Jesus. He's talking about those who were faithful to the point where they were killed for their faith. And they'll get the crown of life. Isn't that awesome? That's really cool. Jesus says to this church at Smyrna, he says, yeah, you guys are struggling, and you think you're poor and of no account, but I think you're rich. You're rich in faith. And when you die, because of that faith, I'm going to give you a special reward. That's really cool. So why, if Jesus has nothing against the church at Smyrna, does he allow it to suffer such great persecution? I don't know. I could come up with a lot of theories, throw some theological jargon at you, but the bottom line is, I don't know. That's his business. We live in a fallen world where things are turned upside down. And one day we're going to live in a risen world where things are once again set right side up. That's our hope. I think the message Jesus is revealing to us today is hang in there. I've got it. I've got your back. Don't judge whom I favor by outward appearances or circumstances. Because I look on the inside. Above all, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world, and I'm even now preparing a place for you. That's what Jesus said in the Gospel of John. If I go away, I go and prepare a place for you. 
It's marvelous. He was talking about you and you and you and me and all the Christians that will ever be. So guys, I don't know where you're at in your walk this morning. Maybe you're struggling with one thing or another, relationships, finances, I don't know. Hang in there. Jesus has got it all covered. And remember, and it's, it's kind of tough, I know, but the day of your death is better than the day of your birth. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you don't, there's no better time than right now to take care of that. Because he's offering citizenship in his kingdom. And all you need to do is accept his offer. And he will welcome you as one of his elect into his kingdom forevermore. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this great uh, message to the church of Smyrna. And Lord, help us to get a grip on this idea that we don't see things as they really are. We see things as blind men. We see things veiled. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, that one day we'll see clearly. But that day hasn't come yet. And so we trust in you. We trust in your word. We look forward to one day stepping into eternity with you and looking back at all of these things that we have endured as nothing compared to the riches of being with you forever. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.